Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. Today, we answer the very important question, are lizards ruling the world? No, they're not. Thanks for watching this- Not really, look, we got a bunch of pages. Thank you, Ilza, who wrote this. I'm gonna read it, and uh, let's just say, some episodes I go into, and I'm like, oh, maybe I'll be persuaded or something. Maybe I'm gonna, like, come around to a conspiracy theory. This one I can just tell you I'm not, because obviously it's insane. And, uh, like, pop off in the comments if you think differently, but you've obviously come to the wrong video. <laughs> You've, honestly, you've obviously come to the wrong channel because while this is called Decoding the Unknown and it covers cryptids and stuff, it's from a very sceptical perspective because I host it. Welcome, welcome. Um, it feels like a bit of a strange contradiction for a channel, doesn't it? Anyway, let's just jump in the format of this show. If you're new here, Ilza has written it. I'm going to read it. I've never read it before. Let's go. <laughs> The other day, I was playing Skyrim Elder Scrolls with my cat sitting on my lap. Never played Skyrim. It always struck me as a bit too fantasy. I really want to play- like, I don't really have a lot of time for video games, to be honest. Huh? Why not? But I really want to play that Wild West one. What's it called? Red Dead Redemption, because that looks cool. And I can get into that. Like, I like the history stuff. Love Age of Empires. But I feel like Skyrim's got fantasy elements, right? And that's just not gonna be for me. He loves the dragons. Who? Oh, your cat. Sorry. Uh, not that fond of the Khajiit. No idea what you're talking about, Ilza. <laughs> talking cats is apparently where he draws the line. See, there you go, fantasy. Talking cats. Cats don't talk. What's that TV show with the talking cat, like, back from the 90s? There's a talking black cat with wizards. Sabrina! Is it Sabrina the Teenage Witch? <laughs> Correct! Why do I remember this? As I was playing, I noticed something. Those familiar with the game will know that the Argonians are essentially a race of lizard folk. The character that needs help to kick an addiction is Argonian. The characters treated really badly in one of the towns are Argonians, and one Argonian even asks you to go and steal something. Bloody Argonians, no one wants them, they're bloody criminals. Bloody- I'm racist against Argonians. <laughs> Why is this game so intent on vilifying the lizard folk? Is it a message deeply hidden inside a game warning us that lizard people are bad and should be despised? Is the game an act of revolution against our reptilian oppressors, putting them in their place in a world of ones and zeros because we have no way of doing that in the real world? Of course not. All of this is nonsense. Or is it? Let me know in the comments if this sounds plausible and I'll sell you some merchandise and, exp and books expanding on this theory because we need to get the word out and warn people. Not because, you know, money. <laughs> yeah, any of these conspiracy theories, like when you get to like be a big conspiracy theory person, there's always some sort of like big grift happening behind it, isn't it? Because it's like, yeah, you're selling like anti-lizard pills or like, I don't know, whatever. Like, um... Can I, I mean, he's been like sent to, not sent to prison, obviously, um, sent to court and fines, like, or, or sued for like a billion dollars. Alex Jones, he's like, you know, oh, there's this causing this, and I've got this that will protect you for it. It's like, yeah, yeah, maybe you believe it, but there's also a lot of money pouring in from you saying that you believe it, right? Allegedly, in my opinion. But let's get back to today's conspiracy. If you're thinking the world is spiraling into complete madness due to global warming and a widening economic disparity, you'd be wrong. Mankind is, in fact, facing a threat more dire, for there's a reptilian conspiracy afoot. Or is that a claw, but a bum bum tsh. It's a conspiracy. The human race is nothing but sheep. An insult to sheep, but we'll let that slide. The truth is, there's a blood-drinking, flesh-eating, shape-shifting... Um, word I can't say because YouTube will demonetize me, but let's just say, I've heard people say P-word. Uh, Satanist, reptilian elite, controlling and manipulating the human race. Some theories refer to them, oh, and if you didn't get it from P-word, uh, Jimmy Savile. Boom. Is that too British? Jared from Subway. <laughs> That's American enough, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. You know what P-words that YouTube will demonetize me for. Do you know what I'm saying? Some theories refer to them as Anunnaki or the Archons, but I'm going to stick with Reptoids, humanoid reptilians or just reptilians. The lizards are all in positions of power and influence, like the governments, and they control the media, using mindless entertainment to keep our attention away from what really matters. And to keep things interesting, the Illuminati, they're all lizards too. In fact, I mean, anyone who really believes this will be like, well, they're controlling you too, Simon. They've made you make this piece. They've made you make it sound super silly by making this thing about it. To that, I'm like, what? with conspiracy theories, I was always, you know, like, they're controlling the media or whatever. It was always like, yeah, yeah, I mean, 
I didn't really believe it. But then I became, you know, a part of the media, watched by plenty of people, and no one's come along and been like, ah, how about you make this piece about this, people, okay? Or how about you don't? Or how about this? Or how about that? No one's got. I wish they had, because I'm sure they've got loads of money they could give me. <laughs> The theory is based mainly on the insights of David Icke, but as with most conspiracy theories, there's some disagreement with the details. Apparently the reptilians arrived in ancient times, they experimented with our DNA, and some believe gen this genetic manipulation is still happening. You'd think that after thousands of years they would have gotten whatever they were looking for, genetically speaking, so uh, maybe they're not as smart as we think. It seems believers can't quite agree on what the actual goal of the genetic manipulation is. It's either to make us more controllable, or they're just farming us because because they like having human flesh at reptilian thanksgiving. Some claim the lizard will lead to shapeshifters, while others state that the true reptilians exist in a different dimension, and they're controlling the human race through thought control. Oh, so maybe, maybe they are controlling me, and it's just less obvious. They're like influencing my thoughts from another dimension. <laughs> yeah, that sounds real, doesn't it? <laughs> ah! please. Alternatively, the reptilians are hiding in underground bunkers. There's also a conspiracy. The reptilians here on Earth are hybrids meant to control the human race. In some tales, the hybrids are just managing things until the reptilian overlords return. Oh, where they went is unclear. Many celebrities and politicians have been accused of being reptoids, and Mark Zuckerberg has gone on record stating that he's not a lizard during a live streaming session to answer some burning questions from users. <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg, I feel like he's more likely to be a robot. <laughs> I mean, he's just a regular, not a regular person, but he is a person. He's like made of flesh and blood. I don't believe he's a robot, but he doesn't seem lizardy. He seems he seems like roboty. If that's the most important question someone has, the human race is doomed. Besides, the lizards have been trying to keep their presence a secret. It's not like one of them is suddenly going to shrug his shoulders and say, Ah, you got me. If it wasn't for you meddling kids, I'd still be hidden. The origin of the conspiracy. In the world of conspiracy theories, the overlord theory is actually relatively new. Of course, those trying to prove the theory have dug up proof from the dawn of mankind, but the actual theory seems to have arisen in the 1920s, meaning it's barely a hundred years old. So where did it all start? Well, that would be imaginative authors. In an August 1929 edition of the magazine Weird Tales, where a lot of old-time sci-fi, fantasy, and noir writers got started, a story appeared called The Shadow Kingdom, written by Robert E. Howard, creator of Conan the Barbarian. The villains of the story are the Serpent Men, an ancient pre-human race hoping to replace the King Cull with one of their own, disguised as Cull, as they've done with many of Cull's predecessors. Wait, how does that work? Kings are like, uh, uh, like a bloodline thing, right? So it's like, if the lizard's already replaced the previous guy, when he is a kid, isn't he going to be the lizard kid? Rather than the, the an actual, because they killed off the previous... How's that work? You don't have to think things fully through in fiction. It turns out that these serpent men use magic to shapeshift into human form, and occasionally even resort to mind control. Of course, Carl foils the plans to replace him, and the serpent men get destroyed, so all ends well. The story also mentions Atlanteans, suggesting that Howard was influenced by the work of a Russian-born mystic, Helena Blavatsky. I've mentioned her before. She seems to appear whenever conspiracies are banded about, <laughs> much like that David Icke chap we just mentioned. She was one of the founders of the Theosophical Society and author of The Secret Doctrine, published in 1888, where she discusses all manner of imaginative theories that some people still believe to this day. One of these theories of hers involved a race of dragon men who had a mighty civilization on the continent of Lemuria. You know, it's not a real thing where it's like, yeah, okay, like in 1888 when the world wasn't like fully explored and stuff. Although by 1888 we're getting pretty bloody close. Weren't we? It's unlikely that we'd discover a whole other continent. They discovered Antarctica back in the day, right? But there's not going to be some other continent out there. And when it turns out like we go to space, they send the satellites up there, they have a look around, and they're like, oh, okay, so we have discovered everything. Then it should all fall apart, but then some people will still be like, no, it turns out it's inside. <laughs> there's many concentric layers inside the Earth, and Lemuria's down there. It's like, oh, for fuck's sake, do we have to do this? Then in the 1940s, occultist Maurice Doriel, founder of the Brotherhood of the White Temple in Denver, wrote a pamphlet called Mysteries of the Gobi, in which he describes a race of creatures with the bodies of men and the heads of snakes, who were shapeshifters, of course. At some point in the unspecified past, these snake men waged war against humans and were driven to near extinction. His later writings include underground cities, aliens, and Atlantis. But it's unclear where exactly our occultists got this incredibly scientific information from. It sounds like he's just writing a fiction book. Oh, he's an occultist, though. So, yeah. Oh. I don't... 
He's just right. It's like we've discussed this before. Like if you write a fiction book and say totally non-fiction and all truth, people are like, wow. I mean, dumb people, but it'll still sell more books. H.P. Lovecraft was a friend of Howard, so I saw a few theories suggesting Lovecraft is a possible source for the reptilian conspiracy theory. Now, Lovecraft wrote some really weird stuff, and we can blame him for a lot. Not Cthulhu. We all love Cthulhu. Is that how you pronounce it, Cthulhu? I think so. But I don't think he played much of a part in the rise of the reptilian conspiracy theory. I d I've never read any H.P. Lovecraft. You know, I've not read the, the, is it The Rise of Cthulhu, The Tale of Cthulhu, or whatever it's called. Not read it. Um, I haven't read a lot of classic books, and I am just starting to. I think I mentioned this on an episode previously. I like books? School really put me off classic books, because you just overanalyze the shit out of them, and it's always like, what's the author trying to see in, say in this scene? Like, I don't know, can't we just enjoy the scene? And then we also had to read, like, boring classic books. I recently discovered... I was reading Woodhouse, Wodehouse, however you pronounce it. I read all his books, and it was great. And now I'm reading The Sun Also Rises by Hemingway, and it's brilliant. Yes. A thousand times yes. Like, it is absolutely brilliant, and I'm pretty happy that I go into classic novels. I was getting rather put off it by school, so that's cool. Maybe I'll read some Lovecraft next. Wasn't he like a... Uh, wasn't, wasn't he like racist or something? <laughs> I feel like there's some, something with racism in Lovecraft. Like, it became a bit controversial for some reason. David Icke. While weird tales may have unwittingly laid the foundation for this bizarre conspiracy theory, it all really took off when David Icke arrived on the scene. In 1991, in an interview with talk show host Terry Wogan. Oh, I know Terry Wogan. <laughs> he's like, I don't know if he's a late night host or whatever, but he's like one of these, like, you're the, uh, Americans, I guess he would be like, you know, Jimmy Kimmel, Kimmel, uh, blah, blah. Kimmel or one of these guys like not quite well a late night host but he interviews he interviews people about shit. I can answer the world that he was in fact the son of a godhead before being elevated to this remarkable position Ike was a professional soccer player in the early 1970s before being forced to retire due to arthritis from there he became a popular television host and sportscaster in fact things were going quite well for Ike professionally but that all changed when he visited a psychic healer informed him that he was chosen to save the human race that's quite the revelation, and he sent his life in a drastically different direction. That's the weird thing about David Icke. It's like he was successful before. It's not like he needed to do this like supernatural alleged grift, is it? He didn't need to do that. He was already, which kind of adds a bit more legitimacy to it. I mean, I, obviously, it's not, in my opinion, legitimate because it's all absolute crazy nonsense. But it is interesting that it wasn't like out of a place of desperation. It's like something seemed to go like, Pip, it is mine. Maybe he had a little stroke or something. <laughs> Allegedly, in my opinion. Critics of Ike's have pointed out that his reptilian conspiracy theory seems to have had quite a lot in common with the writings of Doriel and the TV show V that graced our screens in 1983. The cult classic is all about reptilian aliens from outer space wearing fake human skin trying to take over the world. Ike's theory about the Anunnaki, which I'll get to in a minute, also seemed to be heavily based on the writings of Zakaria Sitchin, an author who claimed that the Anunnaki were ancient astronauts with a hand in the origin of the human race. Back in 1976, according to Ike, the reptilians are the Anunnaki, a reptilian race originating on the planet Nibiru. For the last 450,000 years, the Anunnaki have been ruling the Earth in different guises, and more importantly, from different dimensions. Relying on genetic engineering, the Anunnaki have guided the human race through evolution and created a slave race. Yeah, it feels like it. I feel like a slave. I don't feel like a slave. I feel like I'm just living my life, having a good time. Did you miss me? <laughs> They also created human lizard hybrids meant to control the human race on their behalf. This is why all the power in the world is in the hands of a few select families, such as the royal families and all those past and present US presidents who are related. Wait, they're not all related. I mean, everyone's ultimately all related, especially in America, right? They'll be like, you know, he'll be like his eighth cousin twice removed or whatever. But it's like, yeah, well, if you do your ancestry, that's sort of what's happened to you. It's just how family trees work, isn't it? The genetic interbreeding of the rich and powerful is done to maintain a specific genetic structure that gives the hybrid specific abilities, such as shape-shifting. It's more likely to just give them a Habsburg jaw, to be honest. However, the hybrids aren't working alone. Some full-blooded Anunnaki are physically on Earth, while others manipulate events from the lower fourth dimension, whatever that is. By forming a network of secret societies, the Anunnaki have taken full control of our planet. Ike believes that the Anunnaki need to drink human blood! To maintain their human form, of course they do. 
Yeah, that makes sense. The Anunnaki also feed off negative emotions such as fear and aggression. Apparently, they're addicted to adrenal chrome, a hormone released in the body during periods of heightened stress. This explains all those satanic rituals and human sacrifices happening wherever the rich and famous congregate, like Bohemian Grove, for example. All the negative energy released during the sacrifices is gleefully absorbed by the Anunnaki, chilling out in the fourth dimension. Unlike vampires, the Anunnaki don't bite their victims and suck their blood. They cut the throats of their victims and use goblets because lizards have class this drinking of blood and sucking of energy is apparently origin of vampire stories and here i must protest that we kind of leave dracula out of this nonsense he's still recovering from the damage caused by sparkling vampires who can't seem to get through high school the anunnaki are also fond of their rituals and secret societies this allows ike to incorporate all the conspiracy theories his little heart desires into one proper overarching conspiracy from the ancient mystery schools and cults to the more recent knights templar and masonic order to in to global entities like the un and the council of foreign relations to simple drug cartels and satanic churches the anunnaki Anarchy is behind it all. It's just, it's just shut like all with all of this stuff. I'm like, fantastic. You just right now, you're just like blah 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 blah. And I'm like, just show me one piece of evidence. Just show me one piece of solid evidence. What fucking evidence do you have? And I'll be like, cool, cool. I believe it. But there never is. There's never anything solid. It's always like, yeah, maybe this, maybe that. There's a weird photo here. Blah blah blah. Never anything. Never anything you know the conspiracies that are conspiracies that are real they always like come out later you know there's always like some government document like this there's some leak about that some guy says this and he has actual proof it's like yeah like i always think of edward snowden right and the just how much the the, the governments of the world are spying on everybody <laughs> and you're like oh that's a conspiracy theory except eventually someone leaks it and you're like oh my lord okay that's all real boom opinion changed but this has been going on for decades and there's never been anything and it's like come on just one one thing just one like snowden dude for the lizard people and everyone will be like holy shit, bro <laughs> that's intense and then that's it and i'll have to eat crow and that'll be fantastic because i love that i love being proved i'm happy to be proved wrong i just need evidence come on now they use the media and the moon to control the human population yeah <laughs> course the moon you see the moon is a hollow planetoid used by the reptilian overlords to broadcast a signal that stops us human beings from realizing what's happening of course like that moon shot moonberg moon moon's hollow moon what's that movie it's really <laughs> where there's a there's a hollow moon crashing into the earth it's from like last year or two years ago it's rubbish moonfall that's the badger sounds like a james bond movie doesn't it Oh, because that's the move. That's because there's a James Bond movie, Skyfall, isn't there? Skyfall! You see, the moon is a hollow planetoid used by the reptilian overlords to broadcast a signal that stops us human beings from realizing what's happening. Of course, after thousands of years of evolution, the reptilian network is now a vast web of interconnecting secret societies, banks, political parties, media, etc. So I guess we're doomed. Ike lists a whole lot of notable reptilians, but I'm most impressed with the aristocracy. Keeping up appearances while they were losing their heads in the French Revolution couldn't have been easy, so go lizards! However, not everyone believes that Ike is the conspiracy-believing nut that he claims to be. There are some conspiracy theories revolving around Ike himself. Some claim he's actually an agent of a secret society. Some of the things he says are true, but by mixing in crazy theories like reptilian overlords and a hollow moon, he discredits the other theories that hold some grain of truth. I'm very curious about what those other theories with grains of truth are. He's also been accused of anti-Semitism. It's true. <laughs> I feel like conspiracy theories, what do they believe? Ah, at some point, the Jews enter the picture. And they're like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, the Jews. You're like, oh, okay. Thanks. Good to know. It's true that many tropes and themes of his theories are in line with anti-Semitic propaganda about a powerful group of Jewish people controlling the world. However, when asked about this directly, Ike stated that he wasn't talking about one Earth race, Jewish or non-Jewish. Instead, the genetic network of reptilian hybrid overlords can be found in all races of the world. I've watched a few of his interviews, and I think when he talks about lizards drinking blood and ruling the world, he really means lizards, as crazy as that sounds. He's not like, yeah, 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 but by lizards I mean Jews. <laughs> It's not that. He actually believes it's lizards, apparently. 
Ike has quite a following. According to two philosophers, Ike's appeal lies in the way he weaves a number of conspiracy theories into one narrative that is all inclusive and all accounting. Yeah, I mean, that appeals to people with small brains because they can't handle, like, oh my god, all of these things could be happening. The world is out of control. And then one dude's like, yeah, yeah, actually, it's not. This is related to that, and this is related to that. It's very comforting. And if you have a small brain, that's how you, uh, that's how you get comforted because it helps you process, doesn't it? In your tiny little brain where you believe all of this stuff. And I'm sure you think I have a tiny brain because I don't believe this stuff, which is, well, it's just plain silly, isn't it? According to Ike, 9-11, the Oklahoma bombings, and even the Holocaust were all the work of reptoids. JFK was assassinated because he was threatening to expose them. It's true that not a single person Ike has ever accused of being a reptilian, from Obama to the Rothschild family to the royal family and Chris Christopherson, Who's Chris Christopherson? I don't know who this is. Not sure what he ever did being or desert, to deserve being on this list has ever sued Ike for libel. This, of course, is proof, according to David Ike, that he's telling the truth. And whenever Ike finds himself being cancelled or censored, it's not because his theories are ridiculous or downright dangerous and irresponsible. It's because he's getting too close to the truth and people are trying to shut him up. However, if it's true that everyone that gets close to the truth is eliminated and Ike is as close to the truth as he claims, why is he still alive? I'm thinking it's because he's a crackpot, but that's just me. Yeah, it's easy to look at someone like David Ike, and honestly, I can't believe that he doesn't do, if there was like a conspiracy theory out there, he's probably doing more for the conspiracy theory, like to keep it quiet than he is to keep it like to expose it, because everyone like me is like, well, yeah, that guy's an idiot. What a idiot! Oh, what a loser! And you instantly discount all of this nonsense. Where if he was some like Harvard professor or whatever, <laughs> then you'd be like, oh, <laughs> this guy is actually serious. Quite be embarrassing if it turns out David Icke went to Harvard or something, wouldn't it? I mean, for Harvard. Proof. David Icke might set the ball rolling on this reptilian over, but he was a professional football player. So I'm going to guess the answer to that one is no. He didn't go to Harvard. Not that sports people can't be smart, it's just, I don't know, football players have a bit of a reputation. <laughs> David Icke might have set the ball rolling on this reptilian overlord business, but over time, others have come along to add their own two cents to the theory. And as with any good conspiracy theory, there's proof! Once again, I didn't take the time to read all of Icke's books, so some of this proof, all of this proof, or none of this proof could be found in the writings of David Icke. I wouldn't know. I'm guessing that at least some of this proof was thought up or pieced together by other lizard believers. The Ubaid Lizard People so where do you go to find proof that ancient reptilian-like aliens visited the planet in the very distant past? If you've ever pondered this question, I have an answer for you. Ancient Mesopotamia, fantastic, let's go. When Henry Hall and Leonard Woolley first discovered the figurines back in the 1920s, the figurines were described as a drab pottery figure of a man. From reading the comments on one of many videos I watched, I've learned that drab doesn't mean they found the figures to be unimpressive. It's simply an archaeological description, meaning just to make sure we all learn something today. However, since their discovery, not much has been written about them. Luckily for you, I find this a lot more interesting than David Icke's nonsense, so I dug up a bit to find out about more about these interesting figurines. These specimens discovered by Hall and Woolley were excavated near Eridu and al Ubaid. Along with other artifacts discovered in the area, researchers were introduced to a whole new culture that thrived in ancient Mesopotamia around 35 uh, around 5,500 to 4,000 BCE. In order to keep things academic, they named the period the Ubaid period after the place the artifacts were found. Quite a few of these figurines have been discovered over the years, but we're not much closer to finding out what their meaning or function was than when the first lizards made their appearance back in 1920. The highly stylized clay figurines stand at about 5 to 10 centimeters tall, while the more realistic figurines stand at 15 centimeters. It appears the majority of these figurines are female, however, many of them are so damaged it becomes difficult to determine the sex if there was a specific sex to begin with. The figurines have elongated slender figures, which some researchers consider to be typical of youth and physical strength, suggesting that the figures are of adolescence. Every figure has an exaggerated elongated head with slits for eyes and a pinched nose, giving them a reptilian appearance. Due to their reptilian appearance, they were known as the ophidian, meaning snake-like figurines. The figurines are usually decorated with strokes or spots in black paint. These spots are sometimes interpreted to be the scales of a snake by conspiracy theorists. But it's art. That would be like looking at something Picasso drew and being like, well, or like sculpted, and being like, well, you know, in a thousand years, and being like, well, I guess we, you know, there were people who looked like that back in the day with really f***ed up faces. No, it's art. 
Due to a lack of convenient labels or written explanations and guidelines what these figures represent, we don't actually know who made them or why. Many have been found in graves, however, not in children's graves, suggesting that whatever they were, they were most likely not toys. The figurines are also too similar in appearance to be effigies of the deceased person that they were buried with. Archaeological research suggests that the figures were made for specific groups of people. For example, a specific social class like the ruling class, a specific profession like healers or spiritual leaders, or maybe they were only given to a people of a certain age. They weren't found in graves, they were probably used while the person was still alive. When the owner passed away, the figurine was buried with them for some reason. I just think it's some ritualistic, RC sort of, I don't know, whenever something weird happens like this, you just always be like, yeah, yeah, religion. Religion. People's weird beliefs. It's not alien lizard people that they were sculpting and then being buried with them to remind them of their alien lizard overlords, alright? The elongated head might signify skull modification. While we mostly associate skull modification with cultures in the Americas, this was also practiced by some spheres of Ubaid society. Alternatively, it's possible that the intention was simply an exaggerated hairstyle. Another suggestion is that the elongated head and distinct facial features are due to a mask possibly worn during ceremonies or other special occasions. The painted spots and stripes may represent tattoos or scarification. In many cultures, tattoos or scarification is used to show a transition from one phase in a person's life to the next, much like the coming-of-age celebrations and traditions. Considering that the figurines appear to depict young people, this seems very plausible to me. According to ancient aliens, oh no! <laughs> it's like, I'm just reading this, getting lost in the interesting history of it all, right? Like, and, and, as an escape from David Icke and his madness. And then it's like, ah, 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 don't forget, this is decoded the unknown, let's see what ancient aliens think and the guy with the crazy hair. Well known for their reliability, scientific approach, and lack of belief in human creativity. <laughs> this is it. It's art! People in the past can make it up. Just like we can make it up today. No one's like gonna find like a video of Peppa Pig and then being like, oh, they must have had pigs in the past with all their facial features on one side of their face. It's just not gonna happen. Peppa Pig is weird, isn't it? Well, yes. I've heard that so many times in my life. Never, never did I think. Activity. The figurines are too realistic to be based on mythological or fantasy creatures. The only way the people of the obeyed period could create a lizard woman of such detail is if they actually saw one. However, before you find yourself agreeing with them, I would I, no chance. I was I did not find myself anywhere close to agreeing with them. Obviously, that's insane. Like if someone was like, "Here's a crazy-looking alien creature. Make a sculpture of that." I'd be like, "What? <laughs> How on earth would you expect me to do that?" But if someone gave me a lump of clay and said, "Make a crazy-looking alien," I'd be like, alright. Because of course I could. Because obviously making a copy of something is a lot more challenging than just making something crazy. Obviously. However, before you find yourself agreeing with this, ask yourself this. What will future archaeologists think if they are, all they have to go on is modern art, Funko Pops, and Winnie the Pooh? Exactly. Well said. Mythology. While it's very plausible that the obeyed lizard figurines are related to mythology, there are other mythological tales that the reptilian conspiracy theorists believe are more than just mere tales. They are, in fact, based on actual interactions between our ancient ancestors and lizards from the stars. It's true that you can find reptilian-like gods and beings in most cultures on Earth. South Asian mythology features the Naga, a race of serpent people living in the underground city of Patala. Islamic mythology features the Jinn, a creature that is sometimes depicted as being snake-like. Did we do a video about the Jinn? I feel like maybe we did a long time ago. Mesoamerica has some feathered serpent gods, and apparently Alexander the Great was sired by, you guessed it, a dragon. Of course he was. That's why he's half-dragon. <laughs> Everyone knows that. Look at his statues. Obviously, half dragon. And that's and he could breathe fire. Of course. We stupid. According to Chinese mythology, Emperor Fuxi and his sister Nuwa were both humanoid, but they had the lower bodies of snakes. In fact, apparently all emperors of China are somehow related to dragons. David Icke's favorite mythological beings are the Anunnaki, heavenly beings that show up in Sumerian mythology, specifically the Babylonian creation myth Enuma Elis. The Anunnaki is a race of gods, including individual deities like Enlil, who separated the heaven and the earth. However, the Naga of South Asia seems to be a particular interest to conspiracy believers. These divine beings are sometimes depicted as a serpent, a human, 
or a half-human, half-serpent creature. In some legends, they're dangerous to humans, but in others, they're beneficial to humans. As with most proof found in the realm of conspiracy believers, the real legend of the Naga has been twisted. Patala, the supposed underground city of the Naga, has nothing to do with reptilians. It's a type of underworld or netherworld. I've also read a few theories that claimed the step wells in India are, in fact, entrances to Patala and the reptilian cities. I'm sorry to disappoint, but these wells are not that mysterious or even that at all in the grand scheme of things. They were built in the medieval era for the shocking purpose of, wait for it, collecting water. Oh, what? You... Wow. You're telling me there's a rational explanation behind something? Shocking. Proponents of the reptilian conspiracy state that all mythology featuring reptilian beings are similar, proving reptilian aliens visited the Earth in the ancient past, but this isn't really the case. No, it's not. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> Humans are quite creative, and we have a tendency to make things up. Besides, if depictions of reptilian-like deities suggest that lizard folk once lived among us, ancient Earth must have been a terrifying place. Anubis is a human with the head of a jackal. The Minotaur is a human with the head of a bull. Does that mean we had jackal vogue chilling in Egypt and bovine human hybrids running around Greece? And let's not get started on centaurs. Those are just plain creepy. Is that the goat human thing or the horse? Is it a centaur? A human chest and head, and then the body of a horse. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? It's like, I feel like that's the dude version of a mermaid. It's in our DNA. According to reptilian conspiracy believers, we all have reptilian DNA, which is the result of our ancestors being interbred with reptilians or just having their DNA manipulated by malevolent lizard overlords. And on rare occasions, this DNA will make itself known, proving reptilian involvement. Okay. <laughs> to say human beings have reptilian DNA is not 100% wrong, but it's also a gross oversimplification of the very complicated process of evolution. If you go back millions and millions of years, when our ancestors managed to crawl out of the primordial mark as they say, we weren't exactly the sleek cosmopolitan creatures of today. <laughs> you imagine he rolls out of the muck and it's like, what's this? It's an extremely handsome man in a tuxedo and a beautiful woman in a cocktail dress. <laughs> evolution complete. There was a reptile stage in our evolution. According to believers, this reptilian blood can still be seen in human developments. The human embryo goes through a stage where it looks like a reptile. The oldest part of the human brain, consisting of the brainstem and the cerebellum, was also known as the reptile brain and controls our most primal functions. I don't think the reptile brain actually has anything to do with reptiles, but I'm not a biologist. Isn't that the, uh, the lizard brain? The reptile brain? The c cerebrus? No, that's not it. God damn it, it's right there. It's right there, that little bit of the brain that makes you go, Ah, everything's out to get me all the time. <laughs> I know it well. Occasionally, this reptile DNA will make itself known in more obvious ways. In Houston, Texas, around 2010, doctors treated a man with a three-chambered heart. Reptilian believers latched onto this case as proof of reptilian interference. How does a three-chambered heart work? You need four chambers. Don't you? Don't you need four chambers to make your body work? Because it's like in and out of the lungs and then in and out of the rest of the body. How's that? Oh, wait. Maybe like one is just big. And so it doesn't go through like a... I, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> Reptilian believers latched onto this case as proof of reptilian interference. However, that's not what happened. When you look at human evolution, we started as fish with a two-chambered heart. From there, we evolved into reptiles, so we had three-chambered hearts. Finally, we morphed into our final evolution, much like Pokemon, the mammal stage, where we have a four-chambered heart. How does a... I don't know. I'm not going to speculate on this longer, and I'm not going to look it up, because we're not here for biology, are we? We're here for, like, lizards controlling the world. Uh, this same sequence occurs during the development of the human embryo. So, if there's any defect in the embryo in the early stages of development, it's more likely to lead to some kind of defect like a three-chambered heart. A human with a three-chambered heart is quite rare, but other rare conditions are also blamed on reptiles messing with our DNA, such as ichthyosis. Oh, that is grim. That's the one where it's like people are born with, like, scaly skin skin um and i was making a video about this once and i saw some of those pictures and they are pictures that i will never unsee a skin condition leading to dry scaly skin and syndactyly and ectrodactyly that's the isn't that like the webbed hands 
um, that leads to fused fingers and claw-like hands. Okay, so slightly different, my bad. Since the 1800s, over 100 cases of humans born with tails have been reported to medical journals, which apparently prove reptilian involvement in our genetic evolution. Of course, my cat has a tail, so I guess our reptilian overlords had a bit of trial and error before settling on which species to subjugate. Human? Yes, cat, no. Conspiracy theorists also point out that humans have a lot of junk DNA that we still don't quite understand. Now, let's be honest here. There are lots of things humans don't understand. I'm not convinced any of it is proof of reptilian interference in our evolution. <laughs> it's definitely not proof, that's for sure. It's not even indicative of it being likely. It's not even circumstantial. It's uh, what I would describe as nonsense. The Garden of Eden to prove the existence of reptilian overlords, some believers have turned to religion, and more specifically, the Bible. Ah, oh, yes, the Bible, the perfect place when you want to prove something. You know the snake that tempted Eve to eat the forbidden fruit? No, no, that was no ordinary snake. Good Omens tells us it was Crowley, but our reptilian conspiracy theories firmly believe that it was a humanoid reptilian. What's Good Omens, and who's Crowley? <laughs> Okay. According to the story in Genesis, God created Adam and Eve and placed them in the Garden of Eden to take care of the land. I think we can all agree that we've gloriously failed to do that. They could eat all the fruit from the trees except the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. One day the snake approached Eve and convinced her to eat the fruit. She then gave the fruit to Adam. Of course, God found out and Adam blamed Eve, who then blamed the snake and, and the whole lot of them were punished. Adam and Eve were sent from the garden, Eve was punished with painful childbirth and the snake was doomed to crawl all on its belly for all eternity ah yes <laughs> that famous real story <laughs> Despite what reptilian theories claim, there is nothing in the original story to suggest that a serpent tempting Eve is anything more than just a snake. It's not the devil in disguise, a demon, or a humanoid reptilian. Christian art depicting the serpent as a female humanoid possibly has its roots in the story of Lilith, Adam's first wife, who I know absolutely nothing about. On the rare occasion that I was dragged into a church, she wasn't mentioned. Yep, never heard of Lilith. <laughs> Adam's first wife before Eve. Wasn't Adam or was Eve made out of Adam's rib or was Adam made out of Eve's rib? No one cares. Best do I look like I care? No. Best do I look like I care? No. And obviously it's not real, but like <laughs> Adam had a previous wife. <laughs> what the f is going on? <laughs> The ancient Israelites probably considered it to be the first snake created by God, but it was still just a snake. As with all other mythology and much of religion, the Bible is a combination of history and stories used to explain natural events that people at the time didn't have the science to explain. Questions like, where do humans come from? Why is childbirth so painful? And why don't snakes have legs? Yeah, yeah, uh, and when I say the Bible being like, you know, that place to go to for facts, obviously there's some historical stuff in the Bible, typically in the New Testament, <laughs> and but it's not it, most of it's made up right most of it's i don't know what percentage people are like actual historians have estimated what percentage of the bible do historians reckon is made up it's got to be a lot right of course, the snake in the Garden of Eden isn't the only reptile in the Bible. According to ancient aliens, the snake was only one individual of a race the Bible calls the Seraphim. The word Seraphim is the plural of the Hebrew word Seraph, which refers to a heavenly being. The root of the word actually means to burn or incinerate, which may refer to the Seraphim destroying the enemies of God. Images from ancient Judea depict the Seraphim as winged serpents. The Bible also mentions fiery serpents and flying serpents, which may have given rise to stories of dragons. Even if, by some miracle, the seraph was an actual flying snake that occasionally caught on fire spontaneously, it doesn't match the description of the reptilian supposedly manipulating and controlling humanity. As we've seen with the mythology and archaeology, conspiracy theories are twisting the narrative to fit whatever they're preaching. The story of the Garden of Eden is a myth. As for the seraphim, I like the idea of a race spontane of spontaneously combusting flying lizards. Human imagination really knows no bounds. It's very well put, because that's all it is. It's just imagination. Imagination. I feel like a broken record, but it's like people, conspiracy theorists and, you know, ancient aliens and stuff, they always just assume people in the past had no imagination and no capability. Like they, oh, how could they build the pyramids? They were primitives. How could they, you know, create this sculpture with never seeing an alien? Because they're creative. Give them some credit. They're basically you. You're not that different from them. Caught on film. 
Those of us who were around in the early days of VHS will still remember the weird glitches that occurred when you paused the recording to go get some tea. The image would sometimes flicker between two frames, or it just wouldn't be very clear. The technical term for this is a compression artifact, but it's also just known as noise in the signal. However, according to the reptilian conspiracy crowd, these distortions were far more than that. It was the reptilian disguise slipping just for a moment, revealing the true form of the creature underneath the disguise of your favorite celebrity or politician. Of course, these days we don't need VHS to prove to us that not all politicians and celebrity are in celebrities are entirely human. It also seems that reptilian disguises kept up with the times because as technology advanced, capturing these moments of the reptilian disguise slipping has become quite rare. Yeah, it's got nothing to do with the technology. You know, you just when you pause it, it's just a frame <laughs> rather than... Come on, guys, it's so stupid. What a stupid idiot. Lizards in L.A. Lizards and gold underneath the streets of Los Angeles sounds like something from a movie. However, in January 1934, Los Angeles Times ran a story claiming that one George Warren Schufelt, an engineer, discovered an extensive labyrinth of tunnels and catacombs while conducting a mining survey under Fort Moore Hill. Using his radio x-ray machine, our engineer discovered rooms stacked with golden tablets and passages as deep as 100 feet under the surface. Wait, how would he discover specifically gold table, ta golden tablets with x-rays? You'd know it was a dense metal, but you're not gonna know it's gold. Otherwise, discovering gold would be a lot easy, because everyone easier because everyone would just be X-raying the ground all the time. Now I know what you're thinking. A city filled with treasure hidden beneath the busy streets of LA. We wish. So what made Schufelt's story so believable? Schufelt introduced a Native American gentleman from the Hoppy tribe, Little Chief Greenlee, for L. Macklin, who confirms the tunnels, claiming as proof an old Hoppy legend about a race of highly intelligent and advanced lizard people that built an underground city under LA 5,000 years ago. What are the odds? <laughs> it's just, they just happened to build LA on top of this. Really? And they never came across it? Like, there's some big buildings in LA. They've got to dig down pretty deep for those. They're never coming across those tunnels or anything like that? Or for the sewers? Or for... I mean, Los Angeles is not going to have a metro system, is it? <laughs> Does it? It's famous for, like... Um, I don't know, like, I listen to podcasts and, and stuff that, you know, people live in LA. The public transport seems like a joke. Like, no one... I, I've been. And it's like, I don't... Th I, I went on the bus once. And then I didn't again. Apparently, there were three such cities along the Pacific coast of North America, and the cities had been built underground to escape some sort of cataclysm. A thousand lizard families lived in these cities, keeping records on golden tablets. However, to get to this fortune, our man needed funding, and that meant investors, so Schufelt revealed his discovery to the world, and sure enough, investors came a-calling. With the money from these investors, Schufelt managed to drill a shaft down 250 feet. The hole immediately filled with water, much like the treasure hunters on Oak Island. Schufelt could never solve the water issue, so he wasn't able to get to all of their gold. And eventually the funding dried up in a way the water in the hole never would. Of course, this means that the lost city of the lizard folk filled with gold is still hidden beneath LA. So, was there any truth to Schufelt's claims? Did he really discover an underground lost lizard city? There's absolutely no evidence to back up any of Schufelt's claims. No photos, no artifacts, nothing. His radio x-ray machine had nothing to do with radio waves or x-ray. It was essentially a glorified dowsing rod, the type used to find water. Yet yeah, not used to find water, because obviously dowsing is pseudo science, much like this guy's magical x-ray machine that I already told you is not how it works. It's not how it works today. It's definitely not how it works in what? When did we say? 1934? Come on now. The dowsing pendulum was suspended from a tripod within a glass and metal case that he probably made himself. How he managed to take photos of these tunnels and find stacked piles of gold in the rooms with nothing but a fancy dowsing rod remains unclear. I'm guessing he used his imagination. Yes, bang on. He made it up allegedly in my opinion. On top of all this, Schufelt had a bit of a history of publicity stunts. According to newspaper records, Fort Moore had been a popular site for treasure hunters since the late 1890s, but so far no one had found anything. In March of 1933, a story appeared in the LA Times about a group of treasure hunters searching for conquistador gold under Fort Moore Hill. One C. Warren Schufelt was part of this expedition, and some believe that C. Warren Schufelt and G. Warren Schufelt were the same person. I mean, it'd be a hell of a coincidence if they weren't, right? Unless there happened to be two Schufelts with the same middle name in LA in 1934 and 1933, this seems like a fair assessment. C. Warren Schufelt claims that he had a sheepskin map showing Spanish treasure hidden under the hill more than a hundred years prior. There was much excavating, but no conquistador gold was ever recovered, and it appears that the project was finally abandoned around September of 1933. Then in 1934, Schufelt suddenly reappeared, only this time there was no map and no Spanish. The gold was lizard gold, and the authority was Little Chief Greenleaf. However, this raises another problem. There's no record of L. Macklin, aka Little Chief Greenleaf. 
Of course, it's no guarantee the man didn't exist, but if he did, the only reference to him was a single newspaper article. The supposed hoppy legend about the lizard people building cities underground, hoarding tablets made of gold, doesn't seem to exist either. It's worth noting that the hoppy people didn't even live in California, they lived in Arizona. Schufeld's version of the supposed hoppy legend appears to be a bastardization of a Zuni creation myth, which does mention ancestors living in caves and being more animal-like before they went to the surface. It's interesting, but no more fantastical than any other creation myth. Schufeld's version of events also seems to draw on stories by uh, Robert E. Howard, whom we've already mentioned, and H.P. Lovecraft. These stories were published in the 1920s, so I'm sure Schufeld was well aware of them. It's just imagination. Schufeld's a little bit of a con man, isn't he? You're a fake and a phony and I wish I'd never laid eyes on you! Whoa. In my humble opinion, Schufeld had gone as far as he could with his story of conquistador gold buried underneath Fort Moore Hill. He needed more investors to give him more money, so he mixed up some legends with some sci-fi stories and concocted a whole new myth to bring the dollars rolling in. I'm not sure how well this worked out for our engineer, there's not much available on him after this story, and he finally died in 1957 around age 71. If any of you are still curious, Fort Moore Hill has been excavated extensively during construction projects, and so far, no lizard people or their gold has been found, to the surprise of absolutely nobody. The Dark Side I love a good conspiracy theory. Honestly, despite all the research suggesting the contrary, I firmly believe in the Loch Ness Monster. No, Ilza! Come on now! We did the DNA thing! I remember this from the episode, they took it out and they were like, yeah, there's nothing weird in here. Like, because there'd be DNA, like, that it's shed, like, bits of its weird skin and like, floating around in there, that they'd be, like, sampling up. And there was, they, they know it! It's disproven! Come on! However, the reptilian conspiracy theory has a much darker side to it that tends to get lost in all the mirth that goes with a conspiracy theory as <laughs> obviously bonkers as this one. Oh, God. Well, there's gonna be some mental dude who's like, just gets too involved and kills himself or kills someone else or he, or he assassinates someone he thinks is a lizard. In 2019, here we go, a man stabbed his brother to death with a four-foot sword because God told him his brother was a lizard. A man from Santa Barbara was arrested after murdering his 10-month-old daughter and two-year-old son and dumping their bodies in Mexico because he believed they had serpent DNA. He believed he was saving the world from monsters. A woman murdered her boyfriend. The Nashville bomber, Anthony Quinn Warner, who injured three people after detonating a bomb on Christmas Day in Nashville back in 2020, also believed in the reptilian conspiracy. He might even have hunted reptoids in the park. Some neo-Nazi groups believe that the Illuminati controlling the world, be they lizard or human, tend to be Jewish. Whether Reich is guilty of anti-Semitism or not, there are those who are drawn to the theory by the ideology it seems to support. Any conspiracy theory creating a clear other that should be hated and feared is dangerous. History keeps proving this, but apparently the human race just won't take the lesson to heart. Yeah, because there's always a segment of the human race who are like, my life's Whose fault is that? Let's find a scapegoat. Oh, it's aliens. Oh, it's the Jews. Whatever. You know, there's always going to be that group of people who are just like, they're downtrodden and it's never, it's impossible for it to be their fault. God forbid. Charismatic conspiracy theorists will always be around to pocket the dollars of desperate people. And honestly, if it helps you without hurting anyone else, I'm all for believing whatever conspiracy theory makes your little heart happy. However, innocent children have died because someone believed there's a cartel of reptilian overlords controlling us. Mm. Did they, though? Or did they die because of the failures of the mental health care system? Because obviously these people aren't well. Like, if you believe, if you're believing, if God's telling you to murder your children because they're half lizards, that's schizophrenia or whatever diagnosis would be applied. It's not the conspiracy theory that killed those people, it's the mental illness. In my opinion. If it wasn't that, it would be something else. Smart. This theory is dangerous. People are dying and those preaching it, making money off the fears of unstable minds, should take a long, hard look at themselves. Conclusion. I understand why the idea of a controlling world order, in this case lizards, is so appealing. If we accept that some of the atrocities we see every day are committed by humans, it forces us to confront the possibility of the darkness within ourselves, and while well, that scares us, as it should, it's comforting to lay the blame of all the evil in the world at the feet of our reptilian overlords. Probably the best thing about this theory, for believers anyway, is that it's impossible to disprove. Any piece of proof that this theory was a lie was obviously planted in the minds of the masses by those insidious reptilians. I don't think this really needs said. 
saying, but based on some of the comments I saw on videos attempting to debunk this theory, I'm going to say it anyway. Simon, I apologize for any heat you're going to get from this, but the people must know. I must tell the truth. There are no lizards running your government. It's That's just insulting to lizards everywhere. <laughs> Disclaimer. Those of you that follow other channels in the Whistlerverse probably noticed that this is not the first time we've talked about just how silly and nonsensical this theory is. That's because we had nothing to hide. I didn't even bother to include a paragraph on how to spot the lizard in your life because, as we all know, there is no one associated with any of these channels that fits the description of a reptilian overlord enslaving the human race. This is a lizard-free zone. 100%. Definitely not a lizard. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Uh, if you enjoy this show, why not leave it a leave it a like, leave it a subscribe. If you're listening as a podcast, why not leave it a review? That would be grand. And I'll see you next time.